Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes, one of the associate pastors here, and it is my joy to welcome you to this service of worship at The Vine, an online campus of Wrightsville United Methodist Church. We're so grateful that you are here worshiping with us today, and we'd love to know that you're here. So if you would, please take a moment and click the link that's in this video description or scan the QR code that will show up on your screen in just a few moments. There you can let us know that you're here and tell us how we can be in prayer for you. I'd also like to let you know that we're starting to have the Vine service be a slightly abbreviated version of our in-person Sunday worship. If you would like to see the entirety of Sunday worship, then I would invite you to check out our Facebook live stream. It goes live at 9.45 and on Sunday mornings and will then um, be available also on YouTube the following day. Now I invite you to take a big deep breath and let's prepare our hearts for worship. Please join me now as we pray together our opening congregational prayer. The words are on your screen. God of hope, through the death and resurrection of Jesus, you taught us that the worst thing is never the last thing. Help us to trust in you even when we can't see you working. In the sure and certain hope of your love, we offer ourselves to you. May your will be done in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. There is a balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin sick soul. Sometimes I feel discouraged and think my work's in vain, and then the Holy Spirit revives my soul again. There is a bomb in Gilead that makes the wounded whole. There is a bomb in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. Don't ever feel discouraged for Jesus is your friend. And if you look for knowledge, he'll ne'er refuse to lend. There is a bond in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a bond in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. If you can preach like Peter, if you can pray like Paul, just tell the love of Jesus and say he died for all. There is a bond in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a bond in Gilead to heal the sin sick soul. Hello, I'm Pastor David, one of your associate pastors, and it's my privilege today to lead you in prayer. Uh, I'm recording this prayer while on a mission team in Sri Lanka, in South Asia, and we appreciate your prayers for our mission team and for our safe return home. Let us pray. Lord God, we 
give you thanks for the gift of another day. We thank you for all the ways you have blessed us, none of which we've deserved. We thank you for the beauty and diversity that we see in this wonderful world that you have created. And Lord, we apologize for all the things that we as humans have done to mess up your creation. But help us to always be agents of redemption, always citizens of your kingdom as we strive to be authentic, faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. And Lord, in the midst of giving thanks for blessings, we are aware that there are many needs around us. And we pray, Lord, that you will be a healing presence in the lives of those needing healing, that you'll give guidance to those needing guidance and have trouble finding their way. And we give thanks to you for the opportunity now to lift up names before you of those we would like to remember in prayer today. You may speak out the names of persons you would like to remember in prayer. Hear our prayers, O Lord. Help us to always strive to be your faithful, authentic disciples. Help us to strive to love one another to love our neighbor, to love you. All these things we pray in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray as your confident children using these words. Our Father, Lord in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hello, I'm Pastor David, one of your associate pastors, and it's time for the children's message. So if you have children and youth nearby who aren't already watching this video, now's a great time to call them over. Hey guys, I'm Pastor David, and you might notice that I'm not in church today. I'm actually on a mission trip with a mission team in the country of Sri Lanka, which is a country in Asia, an island nation off the coast of India. And we're out this afternoon visiting an area where there are lots of wild elephants. And you see behind me one of the wild elephants that lives out here. Now, aren't elephants the most special creatures? They are the largest land animals. You know, they can weigh over 10,000 pounds. Um, the trunk that an elephant has, that long nose, that has 40,000 muscles in it, and they can do all kinds of, of neat things with their trunk and pick things up and, and all. And they can use it even uh, like a snorkel if they're swimming. And did you know that elephants can swim? Yes. Elephants go through five sets of teeth in their lifetime, and they can live up to 70 or 80 years. <laughs> you and I only go through two sets of teeth, our baby teeth and then our permanent teeth. So elephants are really great creatures. They're special creatures. They have the biggest brains of any land animal, and they're very smart, very intelligent. But the most important thing about elephants is that they're special because God made them that way. And you know what else? God made you special as well. We read in the Bible that when God created human beings, he created us just a little lower than the angels. And we have all kinds of special abilities. You know, we can talk, uh, we can create, we can build computers and uh, superhighways and automobiles, and we have cell phones and computers and stuff. 
all kinds of special abilities that we have. So you are very special too. And in fact, there's not another person in the entire world that is exactly like you. And God made you special. So the next time you see a picture of an elephant or see an elephant on TV or maybe even a live elephant in a zoo, remember that they are very special because God made them that way. And let that be a reminder that God also made you very, very special. Let's pray together. Lord God, we give you thanks that you love us, that you created the elephant and all the wonders of nature, but also that you created us and made us very special and that you loved us very much. Bless all the children and youth that are watching this video today and their families. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and welcome to The Vine. It's uh, good to be able to worship uh, together today, and uh, thank you for taking uh, time out of your schedule to worship with us. We're starting a new sermon series um, that we're going to be doing for the next few weeks about hope. Uh, it's actually called A Sure and Certain Hope, and so we're looking at different scriptures as we start the year that, um, that resonate with us um, and, and give us hope for tomorrow, hope for today, um, hope for the future. And so today we're looking at um, an interesting passage uh, from Romans chapter 5. We're going to read uh, verses 1 through 11 as uh, Paul writes here to the church in Rome. So he starts out, he says, Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope, there's that word, of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that's been given to us. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly, Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely then, now that we have been justified by His blood, will we be saved through Him from the wrath of God? For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more surely, having been reconciled, will we be saved by His life? But more than that, we even boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Holy and loving God, we thank you that you give us hope when we are struggling the most. Lord, I pray now that you would speak to us a word of hope through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, I need to start with an announcement. Um, today's sermon is not really for everybody. In fact, there are probably lots of sermons who resonate more with one person than another, and this is definitely one of those sermons. In fact, there will be many who will say, I don't really have this issue, but I know there, there are many who do. And for those who don't, I suspect you know someone who does. So I wrote this with those thoughts in mind, you see, today's sermon is intended for people who have a hard time feeling forgiven. And if that's not you, well, I invite you to listen in. Once in a while, I'll run across people who have difficulty feeling that the good news of the gospel is actually for them. They don't have any problem believing all the other miraculous things the church takes to be true, like God becoming human or the resurrection of Jesus or even the virgin birth. They may generally go along with or even enjoy the church's commitment to missions in the world. They might even like church people and choose to spend time around them. But when it comes to accepting God as a positive and joyful presence in daily life, well, it simply doesn't come as good news. Now, you'll need a better psychologist than I to figure out why that is. Does it come from some early mixed-up teachings and preachings about God? Maybe. 
Does it come from some excessive guilt and shame driven home by parents, grandparents, friends, or teachers? Perhaps. Does our society simply shape us this way? I don't know. Now, don't get me wrong. Some feelings of guilt are actually good for us. We need to feel convicted for our bad deeds. One of the worst things I see in this world is people who simply don't care that they have mistreated others on their own path to happiness. That's flat out wrong. But what I'm talking about today are the sins that we never let go of. The ones that keep holding us down. The ones we committed long, long ago and we just can't get over. At the heart, this seems to be a matter of forgiveness. The heart of the gospel is the news that God in Christ forgives us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's one thing to go to church, to sing the hymns and say the prayers, to stand up and affirm this truth, but it's a whole nother thing to know in your heart of hearts that that is good news for you. Emory preaching professor Tom Long tells about his first failure in pastoral ministry. All his seminary books were unpacked, all the pencils were sharpened at his desk, and a church member knocked on his door and asked if he had a few minutes to talk. She started right in. I know I shouldn't feel this way, she said, but I just don't think God can ever forgive me. A few minutes became an hour. Tom asked, what is the burden that you're carrying? She was a devoted mother, a loyal spouse, a committed church member. She'd never robbed a bank. She didn't have some secret addiction. She had no shameful secret to bear. He tried giving her some spiritual sound bites, you know, like, I promise God loves you. God forgives your sins just trying some quick fix to get her through the moment. Her reply was, I know God loves me. I know Jesus died for my sins. I know all that. I just can't overcome the feeling that God stands in judgment of me. Now, don't raise your hand out there, but if, is anyone tracking with me today? Do you know how that feels? I'm going to assume somebody said yes. As Tom quips, it's like living in rural France in 1944, and hearing the news of D-Day over the radio. The word of conquest has reached your ears, but the army of liberation has yet to reach your village. The letter of Romans seems to be sent to folks in that village. It's sent to people like us. It's a gift to people who gather every week to confess their sins and hear the assurance of God's pardon, yet they can't help but sense that nothing has really changed. Maybe that's why Paul keeps hammering away about the power of forgiveness. He insists that the atoning death of Jesus is a foundational issue which calls the very church into existence. I personally think it is the most important characteristic of Christians. We are included in the power and purpose of the gospel because Christ died for us and forgave our sins. The difficulty is in believing that it's true, really true, that we are forgiven. I recently read about a minister who served a little church in a sleepy little town. He said sometimes the high school has a good wrestling team. Other than that, nothing much happens around here. A college professor retired and moved back to that same town, back to, their, to his family homestead. He was well-educated, well-traveled. The minister found him to be a breath of fresh air had a strong speaking voice, and when he wasn't assisting in the worship service or singing in the choir, everybody could still hear his voice when the congregation would say certain words together in the service. Every Sunday at that church, the congregation would say the Lord's Prayer together. And when they got to forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, the retired professor would say, forgive us our trespasses. And with his strong voice, everybody could hear it. And it used to annoy the minister. Forgive us our debts, forgive us our trespasses. One day during coffee hour, he moved over to the man and he said, I notice you say, forgive us our trespasses, even when the rest of us say debts. Now, I know you grew up in this church and people around here have always said debts. I'm curious about that. The retired professor said, my father was the town banker. He always taught us that debts must be repaid, not forgiven. Every dime must be repaid. It was irresponsible to let a debtor off the hook. And so our families always said trespasses. 
I suppose there are a lot of people who believe that, regardless of whatever words they say, that everybody has to repay everything. That old banker and his son might both be shocked to learn that the touchy word in that prayer is not translated debt or trespass. The really touchy word is the one translated as forgive. You see, in Greek, the word that we say forgive actually means cancel, as in cancel our debts, cancel our trespasses, cancel our sins. Everything destructive is canceled. That's what Jesus accomplished on the cross. That's why Paul's proclamation is so powerful. We don't have to keep beating ourselves up about the things we've done or the things we should have done. All that's over. God lets go of it. It is done. It is accomplished. In the final words of Jesus, it is finished. Perhaps you heard about the woman who claimed she was having visions of Jesus. I heard this story long ago when I was just a teenager. The woman was a Roman Catholic and the word spread all over the diocese about her visions. And the reports reached the archbishop who decided to check it out. Is it true, ma'am, that you've been having visions of Jesus, he asked. Yes, she replied. The archbishop said, interesting. Tell you what, next time you have a vision, I want you to ask Jesus to tell you the sins that I confessed at my last confession. The woman was stunned. Did I hear you right, bishop? You actually want me to ask Jesus to tell me the sins of your past? Exactly. Please call me if anything happens. Well, ten days later, she called his office and requested him to come over. And he arrived within the hour. He said, you told me on the phone that you'd had another vision of the Lord. Did you do what I asked? Yes, bishop, she replied. I asked Jesus to tell me the sins that you confessed in your last confession. He leaned forward with anticipation. His eyes narrowed. Well, what did he say? She took his hand and looked him in the eye and said, Bishop, these are his exact words. I can't remember. You see, the Christian faith happens when people accept with complete trust that their sins have been forgiven and forgotten. Somebody else might carry a grudge against you, but it is not God. Jesus Christ has already gone to bat for you. His sacrificial death has already released you. What he accomplished on that cross continues to set us free today. There's nothing that you or I could ever do to erase the power of Christ's one sacrifice. The problem then is not with God. It's with us. We keep hanging on to things. Our memories of sins are longer than God's memory. Either we keep holding those things over somebody else's head as if we exert some power over them, which is definitely a thing, or perhaps we're afraid to believe that God loves us enough, that God has put away our deficiencies and our sins when Jesus died on that cross. Refusing to forgive and refusing to believe you are forgiven are antithetical to what Jesus did for us. It's like saying that what Jesus did doesn't matter. Now, someone out there probably just said, dang, now the preacher's making me feel bad for feeling bad. Well, take a cue from Elsa in Frozen and let it go. Now, suppose all of us fall into bad habits now and then. For a while, years ago, I got into the habit of apologizing for everything. Actually, sometimes I still do. Somebody would say, it's raining today, and I'd say, I'm sorry. I'd be sitting with some people at a restaurant, and one of them would get a lousy dinner, and I'd say, gee, I'm sorry, as if it was somehow my fault. Of course, if I actually did something wrong, like cut somebody off mid-sentence in a conversation, and they might bring it to my attention, and then I might apologize once, and then I'd apologize again, and a week later, I'd still feel bad about it. I feel like I've upset the relationship with this person. One day, I went out to breakfast with some church members, and one of the guys at the table, he got like a runny omelet or something, and I said, I'm sorry we came here for breakfast. And he said, why do you keep saying that? Saying what? You keep apologizing for things. Don't you believe in the atonement? I'm like, what? 
He said, Jesus died once to take away the sins of the world. You keep hanging on to these little problems and then amplifying the rest. I love it when church members preach the gospel to me. His words were a well-needed slap. Not a slap across the face, but like a slap to start a baby breathing. You know, like, now I get it. As Paul Tillich once said somewhere, the greatest burden and joy of the gospel is accepting God's acceptance of you. You are forgiven. You are free from the burdens of your natural inclinations. God is done with giving you a report card for everything. You know why? Because on the day that God was grading your papers, his son reached over on the keyboard and hit the delete button. Until all your sins were gone. Yeah, even that one that keeps you up at night. It happened once and for all. That's a favorite phrase of a lot of uh, New Testament writers, including the writer of Hebrews. And Hebrews, it means two things. First, that the cross is the singular, conclusive, final display of God's forgiveness, once and for all. And second, that the cross is the single, far-reaching event with the most universal effect. It happened once for all. For everybody and everything, the whole world. That includes you. The way I figure it, somebody took Jesus down from that cross a long time ago. There's no reason for any of us to keep him up there. Let him do what he came here to do. Remember, he didn't die for us after we became perfect. He died for us while we were yet sinners. To take those sins away. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, we thank you that you have sent your son Jesus to take away the sins of the world, including mine, including everyone who's listening, including everyone we know, and everyone we don't know. Help us to accept that. Help us to live as forgiven and reconciled people, knowing that you have put those things away. They do not have to be stumbling blocks between us and you. Lord, thank you for your grace. It truly is amazing. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. God's grace truly is amazing. He sent his son, Jesus take away the sins of the world. He loves us that much. He loves you that much. Let him do what he came to do. Let that go. Because Jesus certainly has. That's why he came. For your sake and for mine. Go in peace. And may the love of Jesus Christ our Lord the grace poured out by our loving Father, and the power of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Go now in peace. Go now in peace. May the love of God surround you everywhere, everywhere you are.